Thank you so much, Justice Heck, for your words and your years of service and partnership with the legal aid community in Texas and around the country, and particularly for your partnership with LSC. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to introduce Cindy Tisdale, who will be leading our first of two panel discussions today with leaders in the field of domestic violence. Cindy is a partner at Gorenson Bain Osley PLLC in Granbury, Texas, I hope I said that right, and of counsel with Lynch uh, Chapel and also uh, in Midland. And she's done family law her, her entire career, in particular divorce and custody. It's a really tough area, so we appreciate that dedication. After serving in just about every possible role with the State Bar, Cindy is currently the president of the State Bar of Texas, and she earned her JD from Baylor Law School. So let's welcome Cindy to the stage, and she will introduce the panel. So I would like to go ahead and introduce the panelists we have today. We have Maisha Coulter. If you'd come on up, there she is. Uh, she has been a CEO of, of the Aid to Victims of Domestic Violence since 2019. As a social worker and attorney, she has dedicated her professional life to advocating for the needs of children and families in crisis. So help me welcome Maisha Coulter, please. <laughs> Next, we have the Honorable Dipple, Dipple Malhotra. If you could come on up, please. She's a judge of Travis County Court at Law 4, where she presided since 2019 over domestic violence cases. Judge Malhotra began her career at nonprofit agencies in California and Texas as an attorney, providing legal representation for people seeking protective orders. She later served in the county and district attorney's offices. Please help me welcome Judge Malhotra. Sonia Lopez serves as the Director of Innovative Programming at Lone Star Legal Aid, overseeing the Crimes Victims Unit, Military and Veterans Unit, Grants Management Department, and various special projects. Pretty much everything I think I mentioned. Um, notably, Sonia played a pivotal role in the establishment of the Texas Crime Victim Legal Assistance Network. Please help me welcome Sonia Lopez. And last but certainly not least, we have Emily Dawn Whitehurst. She is only the fourth person to lead Houston Area Women's Center in its nearly 45-year history. She has spent her career championing, championing human rights and addressing poverty, homelessness, and abuse. Help me welcome Emily Whitehurst. So before we get started on some questions uh, with the, the panel, and yes, I have my phone up here so I can time them and cut them off if need be. Um, I apologize in advance. But I want to kind of get, give some context and background on a few things. In 2019, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that about one in four women and nearly one in 10 men experienced contact sexual violence physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. From the 2019 book, No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Kill Can Kill Us, by Rachel Louise Snyder, it stated that domestic violence, health, and medical costs top more than $8 billion, with a B, annually for taxpayers and cause victims to lose more than 8 million workdays. Domestic violence is a direct cause of homelessness for more than half of our homeless women and is overall the third leading cause of homelessness in our country. Domestic violence and gov violence are deeply connected. Um, you know, there's a, a, the, a case right now at the U.S. Supreme Court, United States versus Rahimi. Um, it's a pending case regarding the Second Amendment, Amendment to the United States Constitution and whether it confers the government's ability to prohibit firearm possession by a person with a domestic violence restraining order. Uh, Mr. Rahimi was convicted of possessing a gun while subject to a domestic violence restraining order issued after he had violently assaulted his domestic partner in a parking lot and shot a gun when he noticed that others were watching him. Mr. Rahimi challenged the law as a violation of the Second Amendment to, uh, right to bear arms. That case... Um, they had oral arguments last fall, and it's up with the Supreme Court now. But this is not just a Texas issue. Uh, every town for gun safety suggests that two-thirds of women killed by an intimate partner are killed with a gun. 
Access to a gun makes it five times more likely that a woman will die at the hands of her domestic abuser. So why are we here? Um, LSE's most recent Justice Gap study found that the rate of intimate partner violence for women is nearly three times higher among those in the lowest income quartile versus those in the highest. 29% of low-income people seeking legal assistance were related to domestic violence, yet only 88% did not receive any help or enough legal help. Civil legal aid providers and partner organizations, of course, play a crucial role in interrupting further incidents of violence. Legal aid attorneys counsel victims. Uh, they locate safer environments for them and their children. They secure temporary and or permanent civil protection orders from the courts and many other types of help, which make a huge difference in the life trajectory of survivor, uh, survivors of domestic violence. So, Maisha, you're first up. Um, data suggests that low-income women experience three times the rate of domestic violence than women in the highest income quartile. Any external factors that add to that stress, isolation, or financial strain can create circumstances where a survivor's safety is further compromised. Can you tell us who is and how many people are seeking services? And then I want you to follow up with how did this change because of the pandemic? Sure. Uh, good morning, and thank you um, for allowing me to be present today. Um, one of the things that you said is absolutely true, that low-income women will experience domestic violence um, at a higher rate. But make no mistake, domestic violence is not a respect of persons. It does impact everyone. Um, socioeconomic status um, or um, culture and ethnicity, those things do not matter. But what does matter is um, those who are encountering domestic violence who are in marginalized um, communities, whether they be um, low income, um, immigrants, the problems tend to be that domestic violence uh, festers in um, a climate of fear and shame. And certainly when you are a undocumented um, person who might be experiencing domestic violence, you're hesitant to um, pursue the traditional avenues for resources, whether that be police, um, social um, resources, or the criminal justice sy uh, system. Um, and those are the um, barriers that a lot of our constituents face. Um, the majority of the clients that we see um, mirror the population of Harris County um, in regard to who is coming to um, get the services that we provide. But what we do find is that hesitancy around um, who they are. So for example, if you have an African-American um, client who comes to us, one of the things that we hear anecdotally is that they are afraid to expose their abusive partner, um, not only because of what might happen to them as a result of that exposure um, by the partner, but what might happen to that person if they encounter the police as a result of a call to um, uh, get relief and help. And so they actually make those contemplations when they are deciding whether or not they should help themselves or help the person who is harming them. And that is something that we really need to be uh, more acutely aware of as we provide the services. We need to be um, sensitive to the cultural and ethnic um, ethnicity of those who need the help that we're um, providing. And certainly because those people are the most likely going to be the ones that um, per will receive legal aid um, services across our state. So we need to really be um, trauma-informed and contemplative of the um, barriers that exceed the barriers of being a person who is being harmed by someone who um, claims to love them or, or who is their intimate partner. Thank you. Um, Sonia, I kind of want to build on that, if you would, please. Uh, could you share a client story that paints kind of a more complete picture of uh, someone that's seeking assistance due to domestic violence? Absolutely. Thank you for having me on the panel. You might want to move the microphone a little bit closer oh, to you. A little bit closer? Is that better? Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, and I can reiterate what Misha is saying. Domestic violence has no boundaries and it impacts individuals from all walks of life. I'll go ahead and share Gloria's story. Is that better, Andy? <laughs> so Gloria had been married for roughly four years. She was undocumented, is undocumented, and suffered physical abuse at the hands of her husband. After about two years of being married, he started to ask her to leave the home. This being despite the fact that she had just found out she was pregnant with their first child. He asked her to leave. 
She didn't have anywhere to go. She didn't have a support system, so she stayed. The abuse continued. She was afraid to call the authorities because her husband would remind her of her immigration status. She didn't know what would happen. She knew, however, she needed to get away when their then two-year-old daughter started showing her how daddy was touching her. Gloria started asking questions about the incident. Her mother-in-law, who was a mandatory reporter, told her, go to the hospital, figure out what's happening. This is when she got connected to services that she didn't even know existed. She was contacted by CPS. She was connected to the Houston Area Women's Center for Support Services. She was then also connected to AVDA, Aids to Victims of Domestic Violence, for assistance with a protective order. She finally found what was there and services that she was able to connect to and what could possibly happen to her. AVDA helped Gloria obtain a protective order for her and her daughter. But her husband, an educated man and someone who had the financial means, filed a divorce action and also appealed the protective order decision. Gloria was again feeling helpless. She was concerned that she couldn't protect her daughter from her abuser. AVDA referred Gloria to the Texas Crime Victim Legal Assistance Network, to Lone Star. And through the appellate process, Lone Star was able to uphold that court's decision. And Gloria today and her daughter are protected. In a similar case, Lone Star was representing a survivor who fled her homeland to escape her abusive spouse. The Houston Area Women's Center opened their doors while Lone Star was able to proceed with their legal case and was able to keep this family united. Justice again prevailed. This collaborative approach among local providers <clears throat> and the community has helped transform us, these local providers, into a beacon of hope for survivors who need us. Thank you so much. Um, Emily, you're up next. Yes, ma'am. In my introduction, I talked a little bit about the, the Rahimi <clears throat> case. Can you talk uh, to us about the correlation between domestic violence and guns and kind of what we need to understand about that? Absolutely. So you mentioned that having a gun in a home makes uh, the lethality rate there five times as much. But I'd like to contextualize uh, what's happening here in Houston for you. Um, in the last three years, uh, we have seen a doubling in domestic violence homicides. And 73% of uh, domestic violence homicides here in the Houston region are due to gun violence. Um, about one out of, just shy of one out of five homicides in the Houston area are domestic violence related. And one out of all 10 crimes uh, reported to HPD are domestic violence related. What I'd like for you to think about is what it would feel like to be uh, one of our hotline call responders. Um, we have trained advocates on the hotline and in the wake of the pandemic, the calls to our hotline have shot through the roof. We manage some over 50,000 calls a year. Uh, and when people call us, we do a lethality assessment if it looks like that's required, and in many, many times it is. And that lethality assessment helps us determine how dangerous the situation is. And one of the most important questions we ask is if there is a gun in the home. In the Houston area, even when we know someone is in lethal danger based on this data-driven tool that we use, this assessment tool, we have to turn over half of those uh, callers away because we do not have sufficient emergency supportive housing. So you can imagine our outrage and alarm when this Rahimi case came forward uh, because the fact that we are debating whether somebody has a constitutional right to a gun when we are on the front lines of trying to save women and children mostly who are uh, being uh, stalked and terrorized is just, it's, it's just unconscionable. Uh, we were thankful to partner with Yetter Coleman and uh, put together an amicus brief, the Houston Area Women's Center submitted a brief to the Supreme Court. I would love for y'all all to read it. I'll send you a link if you contact me. And we also did a change.org petition. Uh, so <laughs> we've got 8,000 signatures saying, no, somebody should not have access to a, a constitutional right to a gun if they're subject to a protective order and have a record of, of domestic violence. So I hope y'all agree. I see some nodding heads. Um, we, we really, really have an issue here. And um, when you're on the front lines of uh, those calls. The other thing that you know, which I really want people to hear today, is those uh, domestic violence abusers who have guns are often over, very overrepresented in mass shooting suspects. Uh, some, some indications say 68% of mass shootings are 
perpetrated by people who have a record of domestic violence. So our callers <laughs> are, I believe, uh, not only just saving lives, but preventing mass shootings mm -hmm. and, and trying to reduce the homicide rate here in the Houston area. Uh, so um, I look forward to collaborating with y'all <laughs> on making sure that we do not see a continued rollback in these vital life-saving protections that we depend on. Thank you so much. Uh, Judge Malhotra, you've heard your three co-panelists, uh, their discussions. Can you tell the audience how you compare that to what you see from the bench in Travis County, mm -hmm. number one, and then how does survivors access to representation affect the outcome? Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here today and to share this stage with, this, with these incredible women. I think they're, every jurisdiction pr probably is seeing the same trends. Uh, we've seen an increase in domestic violence every year. We've seen an increase in requests for protective orders. Travis County is no exception. And we've also seen an increase in homicides related to firearms. Um, just so you all know, just to follow up on some of the statistics that were already given, in 2022, in Texas, 216 people were murdered by intimate partners, over 70% of them with firearms. Travis County, uh, in 2022, we had eight intimate partner homicides and six out of the eight were committed using a firearm. And so we know that the risk of uh, lethality increases by a thousand percent when the abuser has access to firearms. So this is something that is extremely important to me sitting on the bench and it's something that I have to be cognizant of in every decision that I make. Uh, primarily the decisions that I make are, you know, if I'm letting out uh, someone on a personal bond or if they are out on a surety bond or anything like that, that, you know, I need to make sure that there are conditions that are in place in order to uh, obviously uh, preserve the community's safety as well as the survivor's safety. So we're talking about GPS monitors installed in jail, not outside of jail, uh, stay away orders, no contact orders, and specifically with respect to firearms, making orders that uh, disallow abusers from having uh, possession of firearms when they're out on bond. And if there's any indication to the court at all uh, that there has been a history of gun violence or even you know, this particular person had ownership of a gun at some point during the relationship, I always make a relinquishment or a surrender order. They must relinquish within, within this amount of time, give them very specific directions, and then they have to provide a receipt of relinquishment to the court and to pretrial services. Um, and so one of, you know, and this kind of segues into, I think the second question you were asking, which is uh, legal representation and how that impacts survivors of domestic violence. We know that the number one deterrent for people leaving abusive relationships is lack of legal services. We know how daunting it is to leave an abusive relationship. We also know that it takes on average seven times before a person uh, is able to leave an abusive relationship. And so um, once they get away from the abuser, can you imagine if they have children together, if they've been dependent on that person uh, financially, um, you know, and so, and then trying to expect this person to navigate the legal system and its complexities by themselves. Um, I'm really fortunate in that I preside over a specialized domestic violence court. So I hear uh, upwards of 3,000 misdemeanor domestic violence cases every year, as well as uh, I dedicate one day a year, a year I wish, one day a week um, to protective orders, civil protective orders. And so, the few times that we do have someone who's not represented by the Travis County Attorney's Office, it, it's heartbreaking because you can see the level of fear, the intimidation that that person feels. Um, you know, our legal system is not user friendly. It's very complex. It is not always culturally competent. Um, and it is not always trauma informed. But when you have a specialized court, and for those of you who come from jurisdictions where you don't have that luxury, I really think you should be talking about that in your jurisdictions because we have the ability in these specialized courts to provide safety resources. One example I'll give you, and please feel free to cut me off, but uh, one example I'll give you is that, you know, for protective order dockets, we have bailiffs who come in, we have law enforcement officers who are there to escort people to and from court. Um, we have extra officers in the courtroom. Um, we know, you know, that, that all of this 
leads to better outcomes as far as offender accountability and victim safety. So I could really go on and on, but um, I think you get the idea. Don't make me have to stop you, Judge. I don't want to be put in that position. Um, Sonia, uh, as Judge Malhotra just said, you know, uh, navigating the legal system, as we all can imagine, is daunting if you're, you're doing it alone. Um, can you tell the audience what the process is for accessing legal services through Lone Star Legal Aid and, and other legal service providers and what you provide to those uh, domestic, violence, domestic violence survivors? Absolutely. A survivor usually can start their journey to obtaining legal assistance by either calling a hotline um, and the support service organization will connect them to legal services or they've been referred by law enforcement agencies, sometimes like the judiciary as well, and also uh, by bar private bar attorneys who can't take on their cases and they say you need to go to legal aid. But many times it's also just, you know, a request for services directly to legal legal providers. A lot of times we have to do our own awareness into the community, make sure that they know what we're, what we're doing, what kind of services we can provide. In addition, it's kind of just educating the social service agencies. They might be very well attuned to helping someone and counseling them, but they don't know all the services. They don't know exactly what legal aid does. So it's getting out into the communities, not just to the survivors, not just to the um, community, but the actual ser social service agencies and letting them know what exists and how we're able to provide services that we do. Um, Lone Star has several crime survivor projects in itself that just target specific communities, survivor communities. We specialize in reaching veterans, sexual um, assault survivor communities, and social service agencies, elder abuse, and human trafficking. And this is in addition to the already general outreach that we promote. Also, we just want to get a survivor connected to legal services as soon as possible so that they know their legal options. A lot of times when their need, um, maybe resources financially, like the judge mentioned, we can get them public benefits, disability, SNAP benefits, emergency SNAP benefits because the sole income provider is no longer in the home. We can also promote safe and stable housing. That's promoting, um, preventing foreclosures, evictions, maybe even clearing title. Sometimes we've seen cases where ownership of the property is being put in a child's name just to make sure the spouse isn't going to have access to the property. We can also um, help with crime victim compensation packages from the state. We can help with remedies for coerced debt, also um, enforcing child support also getting child support and obtaining it, spousal support, um, IRS on earned income credits, tax debt that's sometimes for innocent spouse provisions. I mean, there's just a plethora of services that we can provide. We can also help with obtaining health care. Sometimes we have found that they're, they're eligible for Medicaid or it's that they are eligible for indigent programs within the county. It's also that sometimes the abuser has decided not to put the family on their medical plan so we can try to enforce those things. There's also um, your general divorce and custody, but also educational services. Sometimes these families are dealing with children that need more in the educational system and they need services. So it's attending ARD meetings, IEPs, um, immigration services with T visas, U visas, and I can keep going on, but also environmental justice to preserve um, home valuations when in turn is going to preserve generational wealth. <clears throat> and let me not forget here in Texas, we help with disaster relief. So I know that sometimes when disasters are happening, sometimes abuse actually goes up. Those statistics go up. I mean, we heard about it during COVID. So it's really important that getting survivors to legal aid and legal providers can actually, it's just important so that they know what is next, what decisions to make. As far as support, Lone Star Legal Aid has tried to ease that burden. Um, you heard me mention earlier the Texas Crime Victim Legal Assistance Network, and that's basically a network that helps bridge the gap between criminal and the civil justice systems. And basically it's putting law enforcement and the social service agencies together by using a portal, and you can actually refer a survivor to multiple services at one time. And it's basically putting the onus of finding services on the network network and not the survivor. 
As additional support, Lone Star um, has a social worker on staff, which is kind of unique for a legal aid program, but we have found it's very, very helpful, especially when someone is dealing with, you know, their legal case and then also with the criminal justice system at the same time. So when you talk about daunting, they have two systems that they've probably sometimes never been aware of, and this social worker has definitely played a vital role in helping them in their recovery. In addition, we've provided extensive training to our staff so that there's sensitive survivor interviews and we can actually meet survivors where they're at. You can have a survivor that has been victimized for the first time, or you can have somebody that's been victimized for years and has finally decided to go ahead and make a change and get to, get to a safer future. So I think we try to empower survivors with the legal tools and support uh, so they can make that break free from their abusive situations and hopefully find that safer future. Thank you. Um, Emily, the, the theme of the most recent Domestic Violence Awareness Month back in October was everyone knows someone. And just the title of that alone shows how pervasive it is in our society. Given the scale of that, there's no single organization that can do it all. So can you tell us how the Houston Women's Area Center is uh, collaborating with community partners here in Houston. Absolutely. So as you've heard, we partner very closely with Lone Star Legal Aid and ABDA to try and braid together uh, all of the resources and help coordinate that on behalf of survivors who are often uh, and understandably traumatized and overwhelmed. Um, one of the interesting partnerships that we're really proud of here at the Houston Area Women's Center is one with the Houston Police Department. Uh, they have a domestic abuse response team where they send out uh, police officers with crime victim advocates and oftentimes healthcare professionals. And in the event that when they go on site, they can determine that this person is in imminent danger, they will bring them directly to our campus. And, and on our campus, whether they're um, uh, stay for a week or for 45 days, which is our average stay, uh, or longer, we've had uh, residents uh, with serious legal security needs state, maybe even up to two years, um, we're able to work with them to provide over the long term free uh, counseling and behavioral health services, housing, financial coaching and empowerment, uh, and uh, of course, the partnership with legal services. I think the other piece I want to just talk about in terms of collaboration and coordination is making sure that people, that includes you, understand the concept of safety planning. Safety planning is probably one of the most important things that we do, but look to everybody in theory to help do. And some of the things you need to know are leaving is in fact the most dangerous time. So if everyone knows someone and intuitively people might think, well, if it's not a safe space, get out. The truth is that may be the most uh, the worst advice to give unless that person has a safety plan. Uh, so doing public information uh, campaigns is a big piece of what we do with Houston Area Women's Center so that people know that uh, they that leaving can be extremely dangerous and that there are key things they can do to put in place to make that leaving uh, safer, especially when it comes to electronics. Te technology has changed the game for people trying to flee. Uh, and uh, certainly getting all their documents together, that can be so helpful if in fact they do need legal services. So safety planning and, and a collective coordinated response. One of the most meaningful partnerships we have in this is with the East End uh, Funeral Home that truly sees the value of safety planning and has helped underwrite this campaign. So that's a kind of an interesting type of collaboration, but there's so many different ways that people can plug in to supporting survivors' overall journey to recovery in the wake of harm. Thank you. Um Maisha, as we know, domestic violence is multidimensional. And so I think we have to look at our response to domestic violence must also be multidimensional. Um, in addition to working with survivors, AVDA provides educational services to men and women who have been violent or abusive um, or controlling to their intimate partner. Can you tell us what have you found that's most effective in breaking that cycle of violence? Sure. Um, Sonia said something um, just now um, in that it's the most dangerous time um, for a survivor to, when they are leaving. And oftentimes we do ask the question, you know, why is this person staying in this relationship? But the more critical question that doesn't get asked often enough is why is the person perpetrating um, this level of abuse through the person who they claim to love? 
Um, and that is something that we consider um, greatly at ABDA. We have the largest BIP or Battering Intervention and Prevention Program in the state of Texas. And that is an opportunity for those who've been identified as harm doers in their relationship to um, get psychoeducation and to really um, uh, think about and be held accountable for the behavior that um, got them referred to us in the first place. Uh, oftentimes we find though that those who are um, harm doers in the relationship are also survivors themselves. They grew up in homes where domestic violence was perpetrated um, by their um, parents, um, and they thought that that was the way to um, behave in a relationship and knew nothing different. And until they have been confronted by other ways to address whatever it is that is motivating them to make those decisions, they don't change. And so this is an opportunity for them to encounter a different way to think. Um, we are with the people who are referred to us for a minimum of 18 weeks. Um, and our facilitators are uh, mental health professionals, LPCs, licensed clinical social workers, psychologists, and they work with them and they retool them in ways that um, they say, those who have actually, um, completed programs, say, um, made them think totally different about their relationship, about their behavior, about their family, and about their future, and the future of their children, um, oftentimes. So we, we think that it is one of the things that we should be considering more. Um, but in addition to that, the other thing that is critical is prevention. And we don't do enough of that. Um, I remember, you know, growing up, we all had a health class, you know, in um, high school or, you know, at some point in our education. We don't have healthy relationship classes. We don't educate children about what is appropriate behavior or what is accountability. And that is something that we've taken on um, at ABDA and other places um, here in Harris County and um, in, in the greater Houston community is helping um, young people to think about uh, relationships in a way that is intentional. Um, we have a number of evidence-based programs that we provide um, by way of curriculum to HISD, Fort Bend ISD, and other um, greater um, uh, uh, educational um, systems. And that, we believe, is much more of a um, lift to um, all of us um, so that if our children and the future um, people respond differently, then we will see these numbers come down. But until that happens, we really do have to hold people accountable. And we, as a society, um, this is a public health crisis. It is impacting all of us. These people have children. They go to school with your children. Um, they are encountering the criminal justice system. They are in the workplace or not in the workplace because they are experiencing domestic violence. So you're, you're feeling it, you don't necessarily know that you're feeling it. But when you start to understand the reverberation of domestic violence, um, you can play a part in trying to curb it um, societally and to really think about um, a different approach and to really stop um, engaging in this sort of victim blaming um, attitude that you know has been around forever. And I don't think that people do it on purpose. You want people to be safe. But that mindset, um, unfortunately, is probably um, supporting us not um, having the types of solutions that ultimately will have the impact that we want to see. We want these numbers to go down. Um, that's, that's the end game. Maybe even go away altogether, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Can we have an amen? Um, Judge, I want to talk to you for a minute. Um, we know you're a judge now, but your path to being judge has included work at nonprofit agencies, um, being the chief prosecutor in the Family Violence Unit in Travis County. Can you tell us kind of how your past um, experiences have influenced your judicial approach to domestic violence? Sure. And one thing that I will share with you all, and I have been pretty open about, is I was exposed to domestic violence as a young child. And so I think because of my experiences, I was just so in tune with some of the, you know, the dynamics that we see with domestic violence. We talk about, um, you know, every day in my courtroom or every week, rather, we have jury trials and we're educating, you know, the, the state and the defense are educating jurors about this issue. And you would be amazed at how many people uh, still have those very common myths and misperceptions about domestic violence. You know, it's just some of the things that Maisha even talked about. Why does why does she stay? Why doesn't she leave? Um, I don't understand. I would be out of there in two seconds. Um, and so my experience, uh, you know, has really led me to um, be very passionate about this work, 
I uh, understand the dynamics and the nuances that are so complex in these cases. Um, and I think that that allows me to better serve the community. I know as a prosecutor, when I first came into the Travis County Attorney's Office, and I remember looking at all the cases that we had and looking at the previous dispositions, and most of these cases were either reduced or they were dismissed. Um, and I started looking at why. Well, we had an affidavit of non-prosecution, which is basically, you know, the, the victim came in and said, it didn't happen, I'm crazy, I made it up, I lied. And so, you know, my first job and the first thing that I wanted to prioritize was teaching my team about these dynamics. And I think everybody who works in this field has to understand the nuances in these cases. I really would suggest that everyone do a 40 hour training, but I know that's not easy to do. But really, it, you, you have to learn what these dynamics are in order to better serve our community. And so that's the first thing that I did. Um, learn what's happening so that you can understand how to be more trauma informed. And you can understand when a victim says, uh, you know what, I don't wanna go forward. And what do you do at that point? And we have the legal resources, we have statutes in place, we have laws in place, you all know this, that will allow us to prosecute these cases and hold offenders accountable, even without the victim's participation, but we don't do it enough. And so, you know, I think, and then moving on to now being a judge, just the, uh, my experience, both as a prosecutor, both working at a nonprofit prior to that, as a staff attorney, and then of course my personal experience have allowed me to create a courtroom that takes into account the safety issues that are at play. Um, you know, we have, as I mentioned before, we have the protective order docket and we do have safeguards in place. Um, we have advocates who come to our courtroom. We, um, I wanna make sure that I'm not missing anything. Uh, one, one of the things, you know, I wanna go back to collaboration and coordination and why we're here today. Um, you know, when we're talking about firearms and things like that, things that we're very concerned about with respect to these cases, it is so critical to have folks representing survivors in court because when you have a specialized court and you have a judge who understands the dynamics of domestic violence, that's one thing, but most jurisdictions don't have that. And so, you don't know what you're sending that survivor into. It could be a courtroom where a judge has no clue what is happening. I remember practicing uh, as a staff attorney at a shelter back in the Bay Area years and years ago and walking into a courtroom with someone and my client, who was a survivor, was very upset, hysterical. She saw uh, the, you know, the other party there and let's not forget that batterers weaponize the legal system to intimidate, to threaten uh, survivors and to ensure that they won't seek legal protections. And I remember the judge, and I will never forget this, the judge said, why are you so hysterical? Mm. And, you know, and so for me, I, I just, you know, of course at that time, I never thought in a million years I'd be presiding over a domestic violence court. But for me, every day it is so important that any approach that I take on any case is trauma-informed. Um, and again, I have to also say this as well, my personal experience also allowed me to understand that change can happen, that people can change. But as Maisha said earlier, you know, we have to give them the tools to be able to do that. So these better in intervention programs are critical in allowing people to unlearn unhealthy behaviors and to relearn how to engage with someone in a healthy relationship and a healthy dynamic, so. Thank you, Judge. Talking about people changing, we're gonna kind of finish this out. You know, we've all made clear that access to legal services um, can have the long-term impact on survivors, on their families, on communities. So uh, Maisha, Sonia, and Emily, uh, and only them because you don't have clients at this time, Judge, but could the three of you just have one minute each with a quick client story that illustrates the benefits, how they help these survivors, and kind of give us a hope, hopeful and helpful outlook for this. Sure. Um, so I'll quickly say this. I've been with ABDA in, a, in total 17 years, so I have too many client stories uh, in my head. But I do want to say that I know that what we do changes people's lives because 
the clients tell us daily. They tell us. Um, they tell us through letters. They tell us through um, pictures that they send to us um, with their children, um, you know, going to school, engaging in activities that they would not have been able to do had we not secured, um, you know, superior rights between them and their partner who did use the legal system to abuse them continu continuously. So what I'm, I want to say more importantly is that you all have a role to play, anyone who is supporting uh, Legal Services Corps and trying to make sure that we have the resources to do this work, do everything you can in your power to make sure that the resources continue to be there and that they do grow. Um, because the problem is not going away, but there are people whose lives are on the line. Um, again, thousands of people we've helped over the years. It would make no sense for me to pick out just one. But n trust me when I say that they are there and they are changed forever, but they cannot be without these resources. They have no other places to go if these resources are not available. Thank you, Maisha. Sonia? I think one of the most important things we do when we meet survivors is definitely continuing to keep them housed. I think having a roof over your head is super important, especially when you have young children and don't know where to go, um, when you might be undocumented or very low income, and it's where do you go to actually you know, get another apartment when the sole provider is now gone, or you just don't have... Um, you know, the rental income or the wages that you might have needed to get that rental on your own. So I think when we're actually trying to enforce these rights for our clients and we say, no, this is the exclusive primary residence for the family that's been abused, I think that's very important. And I think it goes long term so that they can actually know where they're going to raise their children, continue to keep that roof over their head for stability, and then their education. I just think it just flows down. So if I had to say anything, it's not one client story, but it's absolutely trying to just preserve homes. Thank you. Emily? OK, I'll, I'll end with a quote from a client who received services at Hawk. I'm grateful for Hawk. The program provided everything I needed to get things on track. I am now a licensed professional able to provide my own lifestyle. If it wasn't for the Hawk program, I would not have made it free from my abuser's financial and physical abuse. I am ever grateful for my case manager. She has the heart and knowledge to help those in need. I know that I am able to help someone else understand that you can be free from abuse and able to make it on your own. Thank you, Hawk, for everything. So the greatest privilege we have working at these organizations is we see uh, how investing in these services really does save lives and make a difference. And um, that's such an important point of view to bring to the table because if you're just watching the news, it can feel so demoralizing and there's like there's nothing can be done. But the truth is if you give survivors the support and resources, uh, they can uh, establish life free from violence. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to end. I, I wish everybody to please thank our wonderful panel here for their work. <laughs>